Hello, and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. The FBI identifies the British man who took hostages in Texas over the weekend, and UK police make two arrests in connection with the incident. Some hospitals across the U.S. closed their emergency departments over a surge in COVID-19 cases. This comes as the Surgeon General speaks out against the Supreme Court, striking down Biden's vaccine mandate for private employers. And an underwater volcano erupts off a Pacific island. It leads to tsunami warnings in multiple countries. Two people died all the way in Peru from the waves. Emergency departments and maternity wards have been closed in some hospitals across the country. That's because of staffing shortages. This comes as the number of children admitted to the hospital with COVID rises in Georgia. Hundreds of U.S. hospitals had critical staffing shortages on Saturday. That's according to data from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Some hospitals are having to close part of their facilities because of the shortages. Those include three urgent care centers in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and one in Ohio. Two hospitals in Illinois are planning to end some services, and a hospital in Kansas is planning to close its intensive care unit on February 1st. A surge in COVID-19 cases and a lack of staff. That's why the emergency department in urgent care centers run by advocate Aurora Health in Milwaukee temporarily closed. The company said this allows those health care workers to be deployed to busier urgent care facilities in the area. This comes as a Georgia hospital sees a huge spike in the number of cases of the Omicron variant in children. Jacob Eichenberger is a doctor at the Children's Hospital of Georgia. He says it matches the worst wave from the Delta variant. But it's overwhelming clinics and emergency departments with just the number of kids coming in with um, fevers and real sore throats. And um, it's just a large volume of visits. Fortunately, Um, It's been milder, and we've not seen those same number of children requiring hospitalization. Children usually show milder symptoms, but the number of cases among this age group has left hospitals overwhelmed. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy disagreed with the Supreme Court's decision to block Biden's vaccine mandate for private employers. He called it a setback for public health. Murthy said the ruling does not stop companies from issuing vaccine mandates on their own. Though the Supreme Court is allowing Biden's vaccine mandate for health care facilities, Murthy agrees with the decision and says it will create a safer environment for medical staff and patients. The court's decision has led to a variety of responses from companies. Some are keeping the vaccine requirement, others are dropping them or reinstating them. Cruise ships no longer have to keep COVID-19 safety restrictions in place. The CDC's protocols expired on Friday. Now cruise lines can make the decision whether or not to keep them. Foreign flagged cruise ships that were in U.S. waters used to have strict protocols, including vaccination, testing, and masking. The CDC says it's shifting to a voluntary program to detect, mitigate, and control the spread of COVID-19 on cruise ships. The FBI has identified the man who took hostages at a Texas synagogue over the weekend. NTD's Jessica Beatty has more. The FBI Sunday identified the Texas hostage taker as 44-year-old British national Malik Faisal Akram. He entered this synagogue in Colleyville, Texas, Saturday morning during services and took four people hostage, including the rabbi. He released one man around 5 p.m. and the rest around 9 p.m. Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeting, Prayers answered, all hostages are out alive and safe. Akram died after the hostages were released. It's unclear whether he shot himself or whether the rescue team killed him. On Sunday, British police said they arrested two teenagers in Manchester in connection with Akram, saying they remain in custody for questioning. Akram allegedly demanded the release of Pakistani neuroscientist Afia Siddiqui. She was convicted of trying to kill U.S. Army officers in Afghanistan and is now serving an 86-year sentence in Texas, about 15 miles away from the synagogue. Akram's brother posted on Facebook that Akram suffered from mental illness. He wrote, We'd like to say that we as a family do not condone any of his actions and would like to sincerely apologize wholeheartedly to all the victims. Afia Siddiqui's lawyer also condemned the hostage incident while it was unfolding, writing, His actions are heinous and wrong. Her case must be addressed through the courts of law. On Sunday, President Biden called the incident an act of terror that will not be tolerated. He also said the attorney general is focused on dealing with such attacks. I also told him that I wanted to make sure we got the word out to synagogues and and places of worship that we're not going to tolerate this. We are focused. We are focused. The attorney general is focused. 
and making sure that we deal with these kinds of acts. Biden also took the opportunity to renew calls for background checks on firearm purchases. While acknowledging if the weapons used were purchased illegally, quote, you can't stop something like this. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Tens of thousands of people across the Carolinas were left without power on Sunday after a winter storm swept across parts of the East Coast. The storm eventually spawned tornadoes in Florida. The dangerous winter storm system, combining high winds and ice, is sending freezing rain, inches of snow and ice across much of the southeast. Duke Energy says 67,000 customers in both North and South Carolina were left without power. By late Sunday evening, that number dropped to almost 44,000 customers. The energy company says the hazardous weather is slowing repairs and nearby states are also dealing with outages. In South Carolina, the National Guard is helping with the storm response and keeping major roads clear. The storm also led to two tornadoes in Florida, and the National Weather Service says more areas could see flooding and strong winds. New York City's mayor comments that homeless people need more mental health services. That's after a killing at a bustling subway station when a woman was pushed in front of an oncoming train. To lose a New Yorker in this fashion would only continue to elevate the fears of individuals not using our subway system. Our recovery is dependent on the public safety in this city and in this subway system. We can do that with the right balance, a balance of safety and a balance of proactively giving people the assistance they need when they're in mental health crisis. The woman was pushed to her death at the Times Square station on Saturday morning around 9.30. The alleged attacker is a 61-year-old homeless man. A second woman told police the man approached her aggressively minutes earlier. She feared he would push her, so she escaped. That's when he pushed the second woman. The man fled the scene, but turned himself in to transit police a short time later. He's being charged with second-degree murder. He is known to police for previous incidents. The tragedy happened a little more than a week after the mayor and governor announced plans to boost subway policing and outreach to homeless people in New York City streets and trains. One of America's greatest aviators has died at the age of 102. Brigadier General Charles McGee, one of the last surviving Tuskegee Airmen, passed away in his sleep Sunday morning. McGee made history by completing 409 combat missions across three major conflicts, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin called him an American hero in a tweet mourning his loss Sunday. The groundbreaking African-American pilot's lifetime of service was honored with the Congressional Gold Medal in 2007. He was later enshrined in the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 2011. McGee is survived by three children, 10 grandchildren, 14 great-grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild. And over in New Orleans, family and friends of the country's oldest World War II veteran gathered to celebrate his life and mourn their loss. Lawrence Brooks died on January 5th at the age of 112. His ceremony was held at the National World War II Museum. After the service, a traditional jazz procession followed before Brooks was taken to a cemetery where he was laid to rest. Brooks was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1940. After Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, he was assigned to the mostly black 91st Engineer General Service Regiment stationed in Australia. His unit built bridges, roads, and airstrips for planes. Brooks was assigned as a caretaker to three white officers. He was discharged from the Army in August 1945 as a private first class. Two people drowned off a beach in northern Peru over the weekend after an underwater volcano erupted in the Pacific Ocean, sending unusually high waves to several coastal areas. Peruvian police said on Twitter that officers found the two victims lifeless. They are the first recorded deaths of the wide-reaching tsunami. Meanwhile, Tonga, where the volcano erupted, remains largely uncontactable with telephone and internet links severed. The official death toll in Tonga and surrounding islands is unknown leaving relatives in faraway places praying for their families. And in Japan, hundreds of thousands of people were advised to evacuate. The public broadcaster, NHK, says waves of more than three feet were hitting coastal areas. Saturday's underwater eruption prompted tsunami warnings, evacuation orders, and huge waves at several South Pacific islands. 
Coming up, tennis star Novak Djokovic is forced to leave Australia as the Australian tennis tournament begins. The Australian government's actions have soured some Djokovic fans. And mass protests in parts of Germany and the Netherlands, thousands took to the streets, railing against local pandemic restrictions and strict vaccine mandates. Stay tuned to find out more. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. Travel for K Original, Jola Nemdo. The moment your five senses awaken, K Culture. The taste of Jola Nemdo leads to the world, K Food. An exhilarating memory that I will cherish. There's no end to happiness, K Life. A great place to truly enjoy traveling, K Travel. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. Thousands of opened and damaged packages lay across the railway tracks in East Los Angeles after thieves took them from trains. We hear more from NTD's John Fredericks. Just three and a half miles from northeast to downtown Los Angeles, railroad cars slowly move along the tracks in the neighborhood of Lincoln Heights. But what lines on the ground is shocking. Thousands upon thousands of empty and shredded boxes stolen from the cargo containers. Destroyed boxes that once contained the hopeful deliveries of snowboarding boots, various medical supplies, and even ripped open boxes of automobile oil sit within arm's reach of our television crew. One doorway to a cargo container gently hangs open with some of the contents still inside, drilled open by looters in the early hours of the morning. They jump on these trains, these, these locks that these containers have, are really sometimes they're plastic seals. You know, the, the locks aren't really sturdy, strong, you know. Um, they, don't, they don't care if the train's moving or not. They jump on the trains, pop the lock, and just start grabbing whatever they see. On top of customers missing their items, neighbors in the area are also concerned about these robberies. One woman remaining anonymous and concerned for her safety shared that a local man was killed by transients responsible for the robberies just by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Another neighbor mentioned that though crime has always been around the railroad tracks, things violently increased over the coronavirus pandemic. Witnesses in the area also stated that the demographic for the crime was broad and included women and out-of-school teenagers, all of whom conceal themselves in masks and hoodies to seal their identities. For those still awaiting packages, there might be the unfortunate chance that it has been intercepted while making its way in and out of Los Angeles. The Australian Open is kicking off without tennis star Novak Djokovic. This comes after a federal court denied Djokovic's visa appeal. Novak Djokovic leaves Australia. He leaves behind his Australian Open dreams to defend his title, signalling an end to a messy and embarrassing visa fiasco. Be dismissed. A unanimous decision by three federal court judges upholding Immigration Minister Alex Hawke's decision to cancel Djokovic's visa. 
citing concerns the unvaccinated player could embolden anti-vaccination sentiment here. An argument Djokovic's lawyers called patently irrational, but the judges were not ruling on the merits of the argument, just the legality. In a statement, Djokovic said, I am extremely disappointed with the court ruling to dismiss my application for judicial review of the minister's decision to cancel my visa, which means I cannot stay in Australia and participate in the Australian Open. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said repeatedly, rules are rules. You need to be fully vaccinated or have a valid medical exemption in order to enter Australia. Sunday night, he added, I welcome the decision to keep our borders strong and keep Australians safe. As I said on Friday, Australians have made many sacrifices during this pandemic and they rightly expect the results of those sacrifices to be protected. Others in Melbourne echoed the Prime Minister's comments that there should be no special treatment, but Djokovic's supporters spoke of their bitter disappointment. Uh, Novak, you've uh, won the fight, but... Um Looks like you lost the political war. Melbourne wake up Monday morning to the start of the Australian Open, self-named the Happy Slam. It's been anything but so far. Djokovic said he was uncomfortable that the focus of the past weeks had been on him and wished the players and those involved in the tournament all the best. With the lucky loser already taking his place for Monday's match, the hope is the focus can finally shift back to the tennis. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has left the door open for Novak Djokovic to compete at next year's Australian Open, despite the tennis superstar facing an automatic three-year ban from entering the country. Under immigration law, Djokovic cannot be granted another visa for three years unless Australia's immigration minister accepts there are compelling or compassionate reasons. Eighty years ago, a legend was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Ahead of what would have been Muhammad Ali's 80th birthday, his friends and family reflect on his life and legacy. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Ali would become one of the most significant sports figures of the 20th century. He won a gold medal in boxing in 1960 at the Olympics in Rome, and then went on to become a three-time world heavyweight champion. His friend, John Ramsey, and daughter, Hannah Ali, recalled his life and legacy. If I had to say his legacy, I think it is more about social justice, about inclusiveness, about trying to bring people together. And that's rare, even for world leaders. Muhammad, he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk every day. Ali died in 2016 and was buried in Louisville, Kentucky. His funeral attracted celebrities, sports legends, and even world leaders to his hometown. But it was the people he touched in his everyday life that made an impact. So he wanted to get out to people, and he enjoyed people too much. And he still had that gift. He, would, he liked it. He liked using it. He, airports, restaurants. He loved the way people clamored around him, and he lifted them up. His daughter, Hannah Ali, says her father should be remembered for the way he treated everyday people. I think that what lives on more than anything else for the people who study him and love him and admire him and know him, really truly know who he was as a human being, is his heart. Is the fact that he was a people's champion. The fact that he loved the people and you could walk up and touch him. The Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville has had exhibits devoted to the champs since its opening in 2005. The center is celebrating his birthday on Monday with special events, including a blood drive and screenings of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The fifth wave of the pandemic is making its way through Europe. As vaccine mandates and other restrictions tighten there, mass protests sparked over the weekend in parts of Germany and the Netherlands. Here's more. As Germany battles the Omicron surge, residents are railing against the country's tightening pandemic restrictions and a possible vaccine mandate. Chanting freedom, about 4,000 protesters marched through the streets in the western city of Frankfurt. Some held slogans like, we are the red line, or school without mask. I'm here because of a mandatory vaccination policy, and I don't want to be forced to get vaccinated, especially in light of the fact that vaccinations don't do any good as we've all found out. Only the one-sided opinion aired on public television is available. The dissent happening isn't communicated through public television. I want to get neutral information, but I can't get it. That's why I'm here. Hundreds more gathered at a rally in Munich. The square is usually the site of the well-known Oktoberfest. Protests in both cities have remained peaceful. 
In the Netherlands, thousands packed the streets in Amsterdam as the country's infection rates hit a new record. Scores of riot police vehicles patrolled neighborhoods where demonstrators marched with banners and yellow umbrellas. I think vaccination is a choice that people should feel what to do. It's our body, I, I believe so. Through the year-end holidays, the country imposed one of Europe's toughest lockdowns for a month. We are one of the only countries, uh, or maybe the only country, which is uh, still in lockdown. Uh, countries around us are, are actually yeah, moving backwards, uh, back to normal life slowly. Amid growing public opposition, the Dutch Prime Minister greenlit the reopening of shops, gyms and hairdressers last Friday. Bars, restaurants, cafes and cultural establishments will remain closed at least until January 25th. Professional athletes wanting to compete in France will soon have to show proof of COVID-19 vaccination. Monday's announcement comes a day after France passed a new vaccine law. The new law requires people to have a vaccine certificate to enter public places, including restaurants, theaters, and sports arenas. It's expected to go into effect by the end of the month. The new legislation puts Serbia's Novak Djokovic's chances of playing in May's French Open in jeopardy. The elite tennis pro was recently deported from Australia after a legal battle over his COVID vaccination status. The Australian Open is the first Grand Slam of the tennis season. The second is the French Open at Roland Garros, which is set to start at the end of May. Italian police say a nurse in Palmero is under arrest for allegedly faking COVID-19 vaccine injections. The woman was placed under house arrest. She is 58 years old and works at a nurse, as a nurse in the Infectious Diseases Department of the Civic Hospital of Palermo. A police statement says the woman benefited from administering a fake booster dose against COVID-19. She is also accused of administering false vaccine inoculations to other compliant people. The nurse allegedly pretended to administer the vaccine to a married couple, but instead intentionally spilled the vaccines. A new investigation has identified a likely suspect in a years-old crime, the betrayal of Anne Frank and her family to the Nazis. The famous terrorist died in a concentration camp in 1945 at age 15 after two years in hiding. Her famous diary was later published by her father. It provides a first-hand account of Jewish life during the war. After six years of cold case investigation, a team of FBI agents, historians, and criminologists have uncovered the suspect, a Jewish notary named Arnold Vandenberg. He allegedly gave up the Frank family to save his own. The investigation uses big data research techniques to compile a master database. It contains lists of Nazi collaborators, informants, and historical documents. The effort marks the first time the probe has employed modern investigative tools. The the attempt to find Frank's family, Betrayer, isn't about filing charges, but to settle one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the Second World War. The new findings will be published in Canadian author Rosemary Sullivan's book, The Betrayal of Anne Frank, due out this Tuesday. In Spain, police have successfully deactivated a Civil War-era bomb. They made the discovery thanks to one resident's particularly good memory. A man there recalled how Italian fascist bombers dropped the device on his town during his childhood more than 80 years ago. Construction on a building in Maia, near Zaragoza, Eastern Spain had been underway, but work was halted after the man said troops bombed the building back when he was just six years old, and that the device had failed to explode. Metal detectors were used to find over a 100-pound bomb. It had been dropped by the Italian Air Force, which sided with the nationalist forces of General Francisco Franco during the war between 1936 and 1939. Bomb disposal officers safely detonated the device on January 10th but the operation was made public on Saturday. A Greek island transformed into a winter wonderland. That's after a rare weekend snowfall, but the unusual weather conditions are causing trouble for islanders. Mayor of the Aegean island of Samothrace said he hadn't seen this much snow in 15 years. Cobblestone streets, village houses, and seaports disappeared under layers of thick white, But under the picturesque scene, firefighters and local authorities are scrambling to rescue villagers trapped in their homes. Difficulties also have been arising in clearing village streets as they're too narrow for road graders or snow plows to 
snowplows to fit through. Local media reports sporadic power outages during the day and below freezing temperatures at night. A cold front has swept through Greece over the past few days, leading temperatures to plummet. Some areas saw high winds, snowfall, heavy rains, and even flooding. Firefighters are now working to remove fallen trees and pump water from flooded homes, particularly in northern Greece. You might hear some howling at the moon tonight. The first full moon of the year, known as the Wolf Moon, will appear Monday night. The lunar event was named after wolves that were thought to howl more frequently this time of year, according to the old Farmer's Almanac. The Wolf Moon will peak at 6.51 Eastern Time. You want to look towards the northeast, just above the horizon. But that's not all. NASA says both Jupiter and Saturn will also be visible above the southwestern horizon Monday. The January full moon is also referred to as the old moon and the ice moon. Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.